Okay, so this is our fourth lesson, um, if you've been following along, and this is the fourth game from the Kiseido book Invincible. Um, this is the first game where Shusaku is playing against Ota Yuzo, who was a very strong player at that time, one of the strongest players, um, and one of the players that Shusaku played the most uh, throughout his entire career. Um, uh, at this point, Shusaku is still two dawn, so he's taking two stones. And let's take a look at the game. Uh, it starts off very similar to the two stones game, two stone games we've been seeing uh, previously. White makes an approach, and Black does the large knight's enclosure. Um, the commentator for this game in the book was uh, Segoe Kensaku, nine dawn. Uh, professional, and he pointed out that you know nowadays A would just be played in an empty corner, um, but this was sort of the style at the time. White's trying to get some speed, and then he takes one of the empty corners. Black takes the other empty corner, um, and now the biggest thing on the board is approaching or enclosing empty corners. And White's playing a handicap game, right? So he's going to do the more active one, which is to approach. Uh, Black decides to pincer here, which is a pretty good choice. It makes um, it makes an ideal extension, which is five spaces. This is something that's uh, fundamental in Go. It's important to know um, is that a five space extension is generally ideal for development. And the reason for that is uh, when you make five spaces, the opponent uh, can't get a two space extension inside. Even if white were to play twice, he can only get a one space extension in there. And so it's not that easy for white to come in. Um, for now, white plays away, plays another one of these approaches and sees what black is going to do. Black makes that same response that he's been making in uh, all the games. And now white plays here, which is a bit of a strange move. And actually um, Yuzo invented this move. It's not really considered Joseki. It came back into popularity uh, like in the 1920s, the book said. Uh, for a little bit, it became popular again. But pros don't really consider this um, to be Joseki. It is a light way of playing, though, um, and he handles it pretty well. He uses it pretty well. Um, in this case, uh, if we take a look, the A stone is is the stone that's about to get surrounded, um, not so much the B stone. So black is going to go ahead and help that A stone. And he plays here. Um, now the question is, Anything wrong with this move? It's okay, but you can probably see something that is a little lacking. So the problem with... Right. Uh, exactly right. Very good. Um, you got both of, of the things that are sort of lacking in this move. Uh, the first is that it's low. Uh, black is already low at A, so playing low again um, here at R7 really just makes the right side pretty uninteresting. Um, so that's not normal. Normally, you know, if you already have something, a low stone, you want to play a high stone to get a better balance and make a uh, better development. Uh, for example, now if you play here, this relationship is a lot better and the right side looks a lot more interesting. Uh, the second thing that Honey uh, hit on is that this move doesn't really have much effect on white stones. It's playing away from white stones, so white doesn't really care all that much. Uh, whereas if black plays here, it's really putting more pressure on that weakness. Uh, so Kensaku said that black should play um, 
either A or B and put more pressure on white and also raise the right side. Uh, but instead, black just played here, which is an okay move. I mean, you can't really say it's a huge mistake, but at the same time, it seems a little slack. Um, black helped his, his um, let me change that to an A. Black helped his A stone. So, of course, white needs to come after the B stone. And he presses here. Black jumps out to help his one stone. And now white's just going to treat this as a light group. Um, that was basically his strategy with this A move, is that he's just going to treat these stones lightly. Uh, he's broken up the bottom a little bit, and he has options for later. And now he takes this big enclosure. Um, so while these stones may not look all that strong, they're also very light, so it's not that easy for black to find a way to attack them immediately. That's why white's not that worried about it. Um, also, you have to take into account that there's a push at A, which means there is uh, two cuts. So black has some weaknesses he would really need to fix before he could attack white anyway. Um, so now it seems like the biggest area of the board is either going to be the top or the left side. So how do we decide which of those is bigger? Uh, who thinks the left side is bigger? Okay. We've got one for the top. Any reason why? Kaylin likes the top. C15. Right. So C15... Um, makes the left side less interesting, right? Another way of, of putting it is this this shamari, this enclosure, points towards the top. Um, so if you think about the top, it's almost like white has a fifth line position on the top, whereas on the left, he has pretty much just a third line position. Um, the other thing is that if you just count the spaces on the top, um, what is that? Is that... Um, like nine, and then on the right, it's like eight spaces, right? So I think the top is also one space wider. So that's uh, the bigger area. And if another way of thinking of it is that if it was white's turn to play next, white would choose the top. He'd probably play something like A. So black comes in, um, he plays the loose pincer. And what this pincer means um, is that black is more interested in just breaking up the top, which is the developable area, more so than really attacking the A-stone, right? This is the least severe pincer you can play. Um, and that, so that really tells you that black is thinking more about the top than about the attack. Uh, nevertheless, um, white's got to do something with that stone. So he just settles in the corner. This is all Joseki. White gets to live in Sente. Um, this group is already alive. And now the most interesting thing on the board is going to be Black's thickness here, right? Black's potential. So how do we deal with that? What's the best way of dealing with this area? And think uh, calm, calm move. A lot of people would be tempted to, you know, start doing something right away in that area, but there is an important proverb, um, which is oftentimes applicable, which says, you know, reduce the, the big area by approaching it first. So this is really the calm way um, to deal with this, right? First, he's making sure black can't get any bigger along the top. He's also taking a really nice point for himself, and he's prepared to do something next. Um, so this is a really good way of starting to deal with this area. Black wants to make sure that this thickness that he got doesn't go to waste, right? Because 
there was an, an exchange of territory for influence. So black jumps to keep those stones worthwhile. And now is when white's going to start to actually do something in this area. He's going to use the A stone, uh, that odd G stone there, because he already made the, the approach at B to limit it. Uh, so he jumps out, and that's aiming at getting this free peep next, uh, which would ruin a lot of black shape, also would help white to start getting forcing moves. So black plays nice and strong here. Uh, you know, this leaves white very few forcing moves. It also makes black's pos position very strong. Um, it also, you can think of it maybe making the right side higher as well. So now that white's made that exchange, he goes to start to settle on the side. And he's also threatening to link up to the A stone, right? If white gets a move um, on the triangled spot, he can pretty much link up. So that's the threat in this move. Now black plays here to disconnect. Um, you know, it's not as obvious a disconnect as a more slow move, something like this. But this does help um, fight against that triangle point. So white still needs to help his three stones. And so he comes out um, with the fastest move he can. Notice that he's willing to give some of these stones up. Uh, for example, if white, if black were to push at B, uh, black or white would just block. If black cuts, white can just give up one stone. So again, he's playing really light shape, right? Um, A group is light, similar to how the B group is light. So let's take a look at this so we can see how this a stone actually makes a difference if white tries to play here it's not as easy to link up as in the normal situation um, because of this a stone right here black is ready to play a cut at b right so that stone actually makes a big difference black can cut here and white hasn't really connected so that was the meaning of h15 uh, so back to the real game this is where it gets a little bit interesting so i guess at this point let's just stop and ask what's the most important thing going on the board right now any ideas Does black have any groups that could be possibly weak? The top, right. You always want to sort of go for the weak groups first, right? Um, I tend to use, you know, Shy Ghost List because he was my teacher for a long time. And so the first question, you know, is, does black have any weak groups? And, well, the A group isn't that weak. It's hard to say it's very weak. It could be weak, right? There's white stones all around. And also, the white group I marked here isn't really strong either. So when you've got, you know, one weak group for each side on the top, that's probably going to be the most important area. Uh, however, Shusaku decides to just play a big move here, uh, which remember I said earlier that black would have to probably defend before he could really do anything to attack these three stones. And so this move is big for points. It's also starting to get stronger and ready to attack. Um, but this move actually gives a very big opportunity to white to take control on the top. And he he doesn't let the opportunity um, 
go to waste. He handles this very well. So the first thing he does is he wants to handle these three weak stones um, before playing on top. So he makes the press. This is almost like a standard sequence of forcing moves. You can find this in quite a number of Joseki. First he makes you know the exchange here, then the attach. And now when, when um, white plays this bump here, he's threatening to come through at A. So black has to respond. Um, and you can see white's gotten a lot of extra shape in this area in Sente. And now he comes back and caps this group, right? So that's going to help white's weak group. It's also going to attack black's weak, weak, black's weak group. So Kensaku thought that black should just play here. He said this takes precedence over uh, the big move at the bottom. Black's got to keep this group strong. Um, another thing that I guess maybe is worth noting is that in this shape, there's actually a famous Tesiji for settling. Uh, probably a lot of you know it. It's this move here, which if, uh, essentially makes Mi of A and B. So for example, if um, white goes to play here, black can push. And essentially what happens here is that uh, the two stones get used as a sacrifice and black gets a bunch of shape on the outside get strong and sente almost alive. Um, but in this case, you know, Kensaku suggested this move rather than B. And I think that's because, again, A is looking, still looking towards white's weak group rather than B, which is more of just, you know, settle myself sort of deal. So white gets this cap. This is kind of, you know, the thing that white is waiting for in a handicap game, an opportunity to really take control, right? And at this point, black plays an attach here. And this turns out to be an overplay. Um, I think black should probably just play here and settle similar to how I showed earlier, uh, but he plays here. So let's see what happens. The problem here is that um, black can live in the corner, but white knows what's going on, right? He just plays solidly here and says, okay, sure, you can live in the corner, but what about, what about your three stones? So black gets to Atari. And now there's still two cuts, right? So black's still not alive yet. Has to live here in Gote. And now white gets to play here. So it looks pretty bad, right? For something like this to happen so early in the game, uh, first 50 moves of the game. Uh, Kensaku's comment, comment was that white seems to have like an iron grip on these three stones. Yeah, it is pretty crazy, huh? <laughs> it's not dead though, because it's uh, Shusaku. But let's see what happens. Uh, connecting would definitely be way too heavy. So instead of doing that, he comes, you know, for the vital point, playing towards white's weaknesses as well. White plays here, which tidies up uh, his shape. Black continues to get uh, some forcing moves here. Still getting forcing moves. White defends the shape. And notice um, A is not the only group that uh, White is looking at. There's also the B group, right? Um, there's quite a distance over here on the right hand side. Um, so this is almost like a double attack and we'll see that soon. 
but black needs to help the A group first, and the best way to do that is to try and get to the side. So he plays this clamp testigy here. White keeps everything strong. Black makes shape. And at this point, white decides to go ahead and attack this group for a little bit. Uh, this group is really, really heavy. So unfortunately, he's going to have to touch white's weak stone to get some help. White hanes. Black extends. All normal shapes here. And now, because... Black was forced to touch the weak stone. You can see just how strong it got really quickly, right? And white is still threatening to Hane through at A, right? He can cut if he gets to Hane at A. So black still has to keep that nice and connected, which allows white to connect everything nicely here. Uh, at this point, uh, a is pretty much sealed, so black has to get back to taking care of this. Um, and there's still the cut at B, so he plays a forcing move here, which hurts his corner a little bit, but it connects these two stones. And now black pretty much has to live, but he's going to play some forcing moves first. White, of course, is not going to let black get out. But black got these two moves on the outside, which may be helpful later. So he knows he has to go back and live, but he just got those first. Um, and now black is actually alive here. Um, it's not pretty. And, you know, white essentially got thickness everywhere. And black still has another weak group. But at least he's taking care of that group for now. Um, so now white goes ahead and surrounds this group. We can see that the game story isn't very good, right? I mean, starting from, oops, let's see, starting from here, the game story is pretty bad, right, for black. He's just having to try and settle his groups the entire time. And white is probably really enjoying himself. So this group gets enclosed. Black pushes here to remove a liberty on that guy. And then he makes this clamp, right? It's the same Tessiji as on the top, and he's just trying to get extra eye space. Uh, he's got one eye around the B area, but he needs to get another one. Um, and we can see that we've got a co sort of shape here. And if you look at this push at A, uh, the meaning of that was to make sure that when black actually captures at B, it's an Atari on that. Um, stone right there. So that's important. Um, and white's going to play the ko, but first he makes an exchange here. I think he's just trying to make everything clear on top. So now he's assured of some ko threats. And he plays here um, to go ahead and start the ko. Now this move might look a little strange, but I think the reason he plays here instead of here, which may look um, more natural or more obvious, is that in this case, black could still get an eye with this sort of deal, right? He can get like a counter Atari. Uh, but with this move, that you can't really do that, right? So this is going to be a real co. And white has his co-threats prepared. That threatens to take away the eye on top. Black has the one eye um, here, and he has to keep the one on top. Black plays a co-threat here. 
Um, even in something as simple as this, uh, there's a small subtle thing you can learn here. Um, notice that black plays from this side, not this side. And that's just because A is the group that the co is being fought over. And so if he loses the co, this way he loses less, right? Whereas if he plays from this side and loses the whole thing, he loses more. So that's a small, subtle detail there. This again threatens to poke the eye out, so black has to respond to that. Black, of course, gets uh, the other code threat here. There's another threat. And at this point, black plays here, which threatens to get an eye. Yeah, if, if the pitch went up, that's because of lag. Hopefully it'll go back to normal. Um, so this actually does threaten to get another eye. Um, white captures. And black follows his threat up. Um, so let's take a look at what happened during this co. Black, his group is OK for now. And we'll take a look at the details in a second. But notice that white got super strong over here. And this group is not completely settled, right? This black group. And white actually decides to try and kill it. Um, he's just keeping the pressure up. Kensaku thought that this was a little too much. He thinks that the result to here is already so good for white that he should just calm down a little bit and probably just connect these stones here. That would be enough. Um, you know, maybe later black will have to spend a move to defend his A, his a stones anyway. Um, but instead he goes for, yeah, he goes for another ko, which definitely makes uh, the game interesting. Only way black can live is to try and go for the co. And I think white's idea is that he's going to use this for the co threats. So he plays here. Um, black doesn't connect at A. He finds a better move, which is here. Um, so let's take a look. Let me click white's move first. This one actually um, does the job a lot better than A. If white were to cut here now, um, black can just kill that, right? Uh, there was another variation here as well that was a little more interesting. There's a co here for later, which we're going to see um, come come up later. Uh, so keep your eye on that. This A is still co, right? Um, but for now, white retakes the co on the bottom. And black plays a co threat here. Yeah, there's a lot of co's going on um, in this game. White captures, so he's killed this black group. But Kensaku didn't think this was really good. Um, it's true, white gets a lot of points, but the problem is when black plays here, the game becomes very simple for black. Um, a lot of white's central influence has just been destroyed. Right. It's just points, right? They're not having a huge effect on the board. So white kind of cashes in his initiative um, for points. So he 
got points, but he kind of loses the initiative. And let's let's see how that happens here. First of all, um, White has to respond to that. Otherwise, his group on top is going to get cut off. That would be no good. So that was Sente. Um, now Black gets to extend here. And this whole A thing really isn't even settled either. Um, so White has to settle that with some forcing moves. Notice that white is sort of losing the initiative. Yeah, and that's it's a very interesting thing to see um, in a lot of these games. And as you get stronger in your own games, you'll start to notice that one move is really all it takes. And it's like just the whole game changes. Um, so here, the normal move would just be to extend, um, but I guess he didn't think that that would have enough effect on black. That's what uh, Kensaku said. So he plays here instead. And he's settling, but notice, since he made the attachment, black's getting a bunch of thickness. And White is very aware of this thickness, um, and he plays maybe a strange-looking move here. It has a lot to do um, with this thickness. So let's let's take a look. Why did he do that? Um, he makes this exchange and then ends up playing here. So let's see. What if he just plays here first? Um, the worry is that with the thickness at A, black can play sort of a crazy looking move here uh, to attack uh, white's group on top. And with all that thickness, black can, you know, just endure the locally broken shape and just point white over at A. And so that's what white is worrying about. But, um, you know, with that exchange made, this move doesn't exist anymore. Right? Because white's just going to get a double Atari. So it's a pretty interesting insight into what he was thinking about and why he played this move. He had a very clear reason for doing it. White cuts. Black extends. This is actually a Joseki. Um, this is a good thing to know, right? Normally when you're in a crosscut situation, it's good to extend. Um, black extends the outside stone because there's no way that white can kill the inside stone. Um, so this is fine. But now white diverts from Joseki. Um, normally, White just needs to Atari here and settle like that. And then black would have to defend next, right? Um, otherwise, white can play at d2. So why is he pushing here instead um, of just playing normal Joseki? Any ideas? I sort of hinted at it earlier. There's, right, there's still the ko um, on top that's lingering. Um, and the reason he's playing a non-joseki move here is that he wants to use it as co-threats for the top. So let's see how that works. Um, Black makes a forcing exchange here to make these stones a little heavier. Also possibly make the A stone less important. Then he blocks. And now, oh no, I ruined the tree again. I thought I was going to make it the whole way this time. White plays here first, um, and then he starts the co. And the reason for that is that if you just, when you do it this way, 
white's actually threatening threatening to kill the entire black group right there's only one eye uh, whereas if he does it like this um, black has he can still live right so that's why white actually blocks here first to really make this co um, just way too heavy for black. And then he plays the co-threat here. Now, n normally black would just play A now, right? Um, but he can't. He, there's no way that black can entertain the co. So he has to capture which means that white got a very, very good result in the low, lower left. Um, whoops, that was a little too far. I just wanted to go back to show the original situation. Um, that C6 stone is pretty lonely, right? And so to get a result like that is very good for white. And that's because he was able to use the co uh, on top. Now black goes after this Aji here. He can't cut through, but he can play here, which is a really nice um, double threat. So essentially white has to give him the Panuki, and that hurts quite a bit. And the center is getting really big for black, right? So that's what white goes after next. Plays the double Hane because he only really cares about getting into the center. It's not so much about these stones here, it's more about just getting into the center. And now black continues to go after the Aji here. He gets a sente move there. He gets a sente move here. That's threatening to start a ko, right? That's too big. So white has to connect. Black turns for the center. White Hanes. And now this move here was a is a very big turning point in the game um, again. Um, Black is actually already winning, but this move is just an overplay, and we'll see why. Um, and the commentary was that Black punishes white weak, white's weaknesses perfectly from this point. Um, essentially what white is thinking is that if he plays the move he really needs to play, the Honte move here, um, it'll go like this and white's going to lose the game anyway. So white just has to go into the center. Unfortunately, um, black punishes this very, very well. So let's take a look at what he does here. Atari and connect. It's pretty straightforward. Now, what's interesting about this is that black uses these stones here, the ones that were dead from before, right? And that's one of the main things that a strong player can do that a weak one can't is that he can use all of his stones, right? Very well. Even the ones that um, are already dead, he can get something out of them. So he starts by playing here, which threatens to live next at A. Uh, that would be an alive shape. So white's got to keep that dead. Black plays the Atari just for the liberties. He plays the peep. And now he presses. You can start to feel that there's Aji, right? White has to block. Black attaches, threatening A, so white has to connect at A. Black wedges in to create cuts, also to strengthen his own shape. Um, so we can see that while black is exploiting the weaknesses, he's starting to cut the A stones off. And that's a big problem. So white tries to save them. 
N4 connect and die. You're saying if white plays here? So let's see what would happen here instead of m5. Oh, n. Oh, okay. Yeah, I understand your comment now. You're saying um, black can't play a because white will just play b and there's no connection. That's true. So. That must mean black has something else here, right? And it, I'm guessing what it means is that he's got this wedge first. And now um, there's an A, B, me, I problem here. And it's sort of the same thing that actually happens in the game, just in a different order. So for instance, let's say he connects. First of all, there's still RG around here, right? Like, what about this there's a lot of Aji. I I didn't actually look at all the variations there's probably tons here but there's just there's a whole lot of Aji in this area um, we can kind of see how they play it out essentially what happens here is black gets this Atari And then this Atari, and white's got to connect uh, on this side. Otherwise, it's going to be something similar, I think. It's going to be um, AB, right? Just too much Aji uh, in this area. And so after making that exchange, black can just descend here. And essentially what he's done with those exchanges is that now he doesn't have to worry about white pushing in at A. White is just cut for sure. And so essentially at this point, white is just looking for a place to resign. Um, black caps. Cross cut, essentially just a resign sequence. Um, and at this point, you know, it's pretty much A, B, me, I. So all of white stones in the middle are dead. And black punished this move really well, essentially. Um, and I think Yuzo was just, you know, depending on him not being able to do that. Um, but he was able to. Um, and so rather than losing on points, he just, you know, he got a quicker, <laughs> a quicker loss. Um, one of the comments, that actually the last comment for this game was really interesting. Um, Segoe Kensaku said that it's hard for him to believe that uh, this is the go of a 13-year-old uh, Black's play. So that was the game. Um, I think this is the most interesting game so far. Um, and... Pretty soon in the book, we're going to be getting out of the handicap games. Um, actually, let me take a look and see how many more there are. The next game is another two-stone game with the same player. Oh, so game six is an even game. Or rather, you know, a game with Shusaku taking black. So the games are going to start getting a lot more interesting soon. Yeah, it's um, it's the Kiseido book called Invincible, The Games of Shusaku. It's actually the book that um, the Kiseido company was created to, to publish this book originally. So it's like, you know, K1 in their um, index of all the books they have. It's a really great book. It's mostly, it's got like a little bit of like history and background in the front. Uh, it, in the beginning of the book, and then the rest are just all game reviews. Um, some games have a lot more 
commentary than others. Like some will be like 10 or more pages of diagrams and uh, commentary. And some of them are a lot less. Like this one was like a page and a half. All right. Well, thanks for joining. I'm glad that we're getting a lot more uh, viewers than some of the, you know, like the first or second lecture. So hopefully it keeps up. And I'll see you guys later.